Good evening. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wheeler Centre. Uh, my name is Simon Abrahams, and I'm the Head of Programming here at the Wheeler Centre. Um, and I would love to uh, acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. We're on uh, Aboriginal land today, and I'd like to pay my respects to, the, to, uh, to their elders, past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are looking for Vikram Chandra, you are in the wrong place. Please make yourself known to our wonderful ushers and they will take you over the road. But instead, we are here today to talk about my two favourite things. So we're here to talk about art and money. And this event is part of the Give It Up for Margaret uh, program, uh, which is a festival that uh, explores the ideas uh, of philanthropy that is presented uh, by the Margaret Lawrence Bequest in partnership with the Victorian College of the Arts. And there's more information uh, about that festival uh, at their website. Um, but before we go any further, I would love to introduce our panel today, which are an extraordinary group of people. To my left, Louise Walsh, who is the CEO of Philanthropy Australia. Previously, Louise was the Director of Development for the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and the founding director of Arts Support Australia, an initiative of the Australia Council where she worked for 10 years. Peter Biggs is the chief executive of ad agency Clemingers in Melbourne. He's the chair of the New Zealand Book Council of Chunky Move and uh, has chaired the New Zealand Government Reference Group on Private Giving and partnership, Partnerships in the Arts. Uh, he was the chair of the Arts Council of New Zealand uh, He's also a board member of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and, full disclosure, a board member of the Wheeler Centre, Peter Biggs. <laughs> um, Rebecca Coates uh, is an independent curator and writer and associate curator at ACCA. She has a PhD exploring the rise of private art foundations as part of a globalised contemporary art world. That sounds fascinating reading. It is. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> the next time. <laughs> And Rupert Meyer, of course, is chair of the Australia Council uh, and on the board of Creative Partnerships Australia, the Meyer Foundation, the Australian International Cultural Foundation, uh, and previously a trustee of the National Gallery of Victoria. Uh, and he, of course, chaired the Australian government's inquiry into the contemporary visual arts and crafts sector in 2002. Would you join me in thanking our extraordinary panellists? Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, as I said, we are here today to talk about art and money and looking at the, the, com the complex relationships between the two and in particular to explore some of the ethics of giving and, and looking at um, the differences between uh, giving uh, in, in individual philanthropy, in corporate sponsorship uh, and, of course, in, in government uh, funding as well and looking if there's a method for financially uh, supporting the arts without compromise. But... Before we kind of get into that, I think it would be remiss of us to not, of course, talk about uh, the budget, which was handed down last week. Rupert's looking at me knowingly, knowing perhaps that a question may be coming his way. Now, of course, the budget um, outlines uh, proposed funding cuts to the arts by $87.1 million over four years, including $28.2 million of cuts to the Australia Council. Uh, most of which uh, will hit the independent artist and small to medium sector. But at the same time, the government has, of course, um, provided $6.4 million to encourage private sector support of the arts, of which $5.4 million is supporting Creative Partnerships Australia. So um, this is setting up, you know, a pretty clear and strong message, I think, around... I mean, that in the government's press release, they talk about... Um, Private, encouraging private sector support for the arts as being vital to the ongoing sustainability of the arts sector. They don't talk about the, um, an ongoing commitment to artistic vibrancy, but they do talk about a commitment to sustainability. Rupert, you are, of course, the chair of the Australia Council, also on the board of Creative Partnerships Australia. What do you, what do you make of this? Thanks for the warm-up, uh, Simon. <laughs> big questions, um, Rupert. That's what we're here to talk questions. about today. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, I think it's really important to, to talk about context. Um, um, and, you know, we've got three tiers of government in Australia. Uh, and, in fact, the federal government is, is, is the junior partner in, in the funding of the arts after the states and, 
and even uh, local government. So th th there is a whole of government conversation that I think it's really valuable uh, to have. Um, I, I, I will answer the question in a sec. Um, I, I mean, I think it's also relevant to consider that it is the Commonwealth government that pays for philanthropy uh, in Australia, in that it's uh, revenue foregone to them because the tax deductions are against uh, income that would otherwise go to the Commonwealth government. In fact, it always puzzles me that state governments don't, uh, don't try even harder to attract uh, philanthropy to their own state because they don't have to pay for it. Uh, and it's another way of getting the Commonwealth to pay for something. Um, in the context of the Australia Council, last year we were, we were 75 million up over four years. This year we're 28 billion down over four years. So a net 47 up over, over two years. So um, from that point of view, that's pleasing. But the comment that you make is absolutely right. And that is there's a, a disproportionate burden on the small to medium uh, arts companies and, and individual artists. And you know, we're doing everything we can to minimise the impact of that, including actually the other half of my brain, you know, working with Creative Partnerships Australia to, uh, uh, to develop a whole lot of programs that might work specifically to, to offset some of those, um, uh, some of those cuts. So there, I guess there are a number of ways of, of approaching that. Um, um, but I'm not wishing to sit here smiling. It's, uh, one would prefer not to be in this position. That's very fair. And Louise, your organisation was one of the few organisations, certainly in my Twitter feed, to uh, put out a press release that was um, pretty positive about the, the budget because you were responding to uh, the, the $6 million re-establishment of the Community Business Partnership. For you, do you see that as the government shifting responsibility away from their own government funding towards private sector support? And is that a good thing? Look, it's 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 an initiative that it will the, the makeup of that partnership will be announced probably imminently actually by the prime minister, and that will be a small group of business leaders and community leaders that will feed through to the prime minister and the minister for social services ideas on how to grow philanthropy, and also um, ideas on for the government on how to remove any impediments to the growth of philanthropy. And interestingly enough, it's not new because it was actually around when John Howard was Prime Minister. And there were a group of community leaders and business leaders on that at the time. So for instance, David Gonski actually chaired the, the tax committee. And as a result of that group, which was 15 years ago, we saw the introduction of private ancillary funds and also the introduction of pre-tax workplace giving. So there were two very tangible outcomes that happened to grow philanthropy. Now, not specifically for arts and culture, but of course, arts and culture benefited. So it, it does give an opportunity um, for community leaders and business leaders and philanthropists to be proposing ideas to this government about what we can do to stimulate um, more philanthropy. And that could be specific to the arts, but it also could be some ideas that might be across the board. So from our perspective, um, that's exciting. It wasn't exactly new news because it was a pre-election promise, um, but there was $6 million tied to it. So that doesn't, I think, necessarily mean that there'll be only $6 million of incentives, I would hope. Um, but we're hoping to obviously, you know, influence that group. And Rebecca, the the arts budget is a is a pretty minuscule um, proportion of the federal mm. budget. It's, you know, 0.13%. So the kind of cuts that we've seen um, outlined in the last week, do you think that's, is that ideologically driven? I think that this was um, always talked about as going to be a tough budget. Yeah. Um, I think it's a tough budget and in a certain number of areas it's a really unfair budget. Uh, so it's very hard to argue that the arts shouldn't have or, or should have been immune from those cuts as well. Uh, like Rupert, I'm not happy about it but I think it's very, you know, we have to continue to make the case for why they should be funded and what role we play in a wider society. So I, I think it's a two-way thing, you know, it's not that they were targeted specifically, mm. it's an across the board, <laughs> cost cutting, let's get us into a surplus or attempt to get us into a surplus uh, proposal. Is it true though? Because if we look at um, the amount of funding that, that was available for um, school chaplains, for example. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, th there is certainly some ideology at, at play there and the amount of money that um, is being cut is having a, a 
relatively small response back I, to get back to surplus. I don't see this government as being particularly pro arts, pro arts and culture. Yeah. Uh, so do you think the arts, or BC perhaps, do you think the arts are uh, seen as too left wing to be to be supported by a conservative government? I, I think there are two things going on in this dynamic. Um, one is, I, I, I think, a, a general debate which is not just happening in Australia but uh, in all Western democracies uh, around what governments can afford now, and and it's it's across party lines. If if you've read Chris Mullins' book, he was a minister in in, in the Blair Labor government. And I read that two or three years ago. I mean, his, his diaries are terrific to read. But he ends with, with, with a, some thoughts on how sustainable is the expectation, the current and future expectations and past expectations of government in Western democracies. And he's saying there, there is a massive culture change that's got to happen as big as the Russian Revolution, you know, as big as, 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 as the Great Leap Forward in China. That This debate has got to happen. Secondly, I think, and, and Rupert and I have discussed this certainly in my experience as Chair of the Arts Council, I think still the arts or, or whomever leads arts organisations, and I am certainly count myself as one of those, we failed to, to see, get governments and the general public to see arts as essential infrastructure. So it makes me really frustrated when, when you have a, a state government here and a, and a, and a, and a Commonwealth government saying that they're going to be infrastructure governments and they don't see arts as, as essential infrastructure. And arts, to me, the argument has to be, is as essential for the human spirit and, and, and human achievement and progress as roads and railways and, and all of those kinds of things. And Fiona Menzies, who sends me really interesting articles from time to time, the, the CEO of Creative Partnerships, sent me a wonderful article where, where a, a, you know, four provocative thinkers in the UK were saying exactly this, that somehow, sometime, the arts have to get discussion about the arts and funding on the same plane as, as a debate about infrastructure. And the, the governments of the day have to see the arts as important as that. Oh, I just want to watch that over and over again. We filmed that. It's all right. We can watch that again. <laughs> Rupert, that's enough on the budget, I think. I could talk all day, but I won't. Rupert, I, I want to ask you, I mean, Australia has a pretty extraordinary um, history of, of philanthropy and philanthropists and some um, pretty extraordinary examples of that. But there's certainly a, a kind of mythology um, that the Americans are the masters of philanthropy and that Australians are um, reluctant to give and that they see that as the role of government. And do you think that's true? Uh, look, I think... Um and, and, and thinking of this in the context of, of Margaret Lawrence is actually a, a, a really good example. Australia has a great history of philanthropy. We underbake it and we don't talk enough about it. Yeah. Mm. Drive around any part of regional Australia and you go into towns that have libraries and hospitals and schools and public halls with plaques uh, reflecting what was, I think, a sort of a period of almost rampant competitive philanthropy uh, as... Uh, uh, as communities and towns were built. And, and we've sort of forgotten about that in, in the narrative of, of philanthropy. And the, the examples that we talk about here in Australia, for some odd reason, are the American outliers. Now, they're outliers in America, um, you know, let alone in Australia. Uh, you know, when I hear someone say, oh, look, we don't give in Australia because we don't have a culture of giving, it's, it's complete ignorance, although there's a direct correlation between the people who say that uh, and those who don't give. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it, it's, a, it's a great argument. And then they'll say, um, if only we had the same incentives as they have in America. Well, of course, a whole lot of the incentives in America are around death duties and other mm. taxes. So the obvious response is, well, let's reintroduce death duties and then we'll have more philanthropy. And they don't like that argument either. <laughs> um, so there are lots of silly things about um, different jurisdictions and, and comparisons that, that get made. But, you know, as they say, the writing is on the wall. You know, all around this institution, uh, there are reminders of, uh, uh, of exactly who has been involved, how they've been involved into supporting uh, this community. Um, and you know, the more we can talk about what's happened in the past as a way of uh, reflecting what the present generation should be, should be doing, I, I think it's, there's a really great story to be told. And part of that too, sorry to jump in, is actually talking about what's been done and that's exactly what this is doing it's it's championing you know a very quiet very um you know 
relatively withdrawn um, individual who's amassed and done an extraordinary thing and it enables us to then talk about a whole range of issues that need to be talked about for us to champion the role of arts and culture in society, its value, its place, and a particular individual that hopefully other people will possibly say, well, you know, actually it doesn't have to be those big people. It can be the everyday mums and dads. It can be the families. It can be whoever. That's the point. And mm. that mm. we too can do this. Um, so here's the example. And it's fun. It can be fun. <laughs> Louise, you've... Um You've all, in your work, you've organised study tours for Australian arts managers to go to the US and, and see what they're doing. Uh, what have they found? I mean, it, what is it that they're doing that, that we're not? Well, uh, Rupert actually just touched on one of the points. Um, in my final time at Arts Support Australia, we took the CEOs and chairs of, I think it was 10 of the big performing arts companies, including the Melbourne Theatre Company, from memory. And um, it was interesting. I mean, th th they learnt a whole bunch of things about the world of private giving and leadership, particularly from the boards and the CEOs. They learnt, for instance, that in some of the New York big performing arts companies, the head of development or fundraising is paid more than the CEO. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. investment banking. They learnt that you actually have to staff up and resource this area properly if you actually want you know, sustainable long-term growth in major gift fundraising. Um, they also learnt, there's a great anecdote that um, one of the meetings they had was a three-hour meeting with the, the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. And it was with the, the head of the board, the head of the development committee, the head of development, and the incoming and outcoming CEO. And the incoming CEO was, had just finished as the managing director of the MSO. And I forget Matthew his ben name. Dixon. Yes. Mm. So he had just arrived in New York to take over mm. the role. And he said to the Australians, I can talk with a lot of authority because I have actually been in Melbourne and seen what's going on in philanthropy and private giving. He said to the group, look, you think you don't have a culture of giving. Sure, it could be better. But you know what you don't have? You don't have a culture of asking. And that was really one of the key mm -hmm. messages um, that that group took home to, to Australia. You know, what are we doing on the asking front that we could be doing better and stronger, potentially more often, um, which, which I thought was quite significant. That, 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 it was a terrific initiative, and and um, and it was it was fantastic that the Australia Council actually organised mm. uh, those who went to come back and feedback to the other kind of performing arts groups and other artistic groups, including Chunky Move. I went along, and I learned just very basic things that the Americans do very well. One, one, I'll come back to that a bit later. But um, one of the key points that I found interesting in the debate was the American model. Is, has a lots of good things and it has also a lot of mm. not so good things mm. in terms of bravery of work. So, so um, work often is, is quite safe. But there are some really, really good things, some basic things like, for example, if you're on an American board, arts board, uh, development and fundraising is number one on mm. the agenda. That's number one. Um, and your point too that the axis isn't the CEO and the artistic director, it's the CEO and the and the, the head of development. Mm. Um, all of those things which put emphasis on a key priority, which it has to be because there isn't the same government funding of arts as there is here. But is that, is that, a, model, is that a model that we should be striving for? I mean, we're, we are seeing um, that is the agenda that the government's clearly putting forward. Certainly, I, I come from the world of um, children's theatre. I worked for a very long time where um, the, the most risky, innovative, interesting artistic work is coming out of... Um, France and Denmark and Sweden and the countries that are, are highly government subsidised, it's not coming from America where the work is safe I, and I commercial and crass. And I, I, I think there are elements of that model we can take and I think, I, mean, we, I think Australians are enormously inventive and innovative and adaptive. So there are, there are elements of that model that we can use and there are elements of the model that we shouldn't touch. Yeah. But I think history again is quite a good guide that there's, there's not a lot that's new under the sun here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the model of... Um, partnership between private sector support and government support you know, has actually been a feature of you know, the way we funded the arts here. You know, think just of the National Gallery of Victoria where the, the government effectively was in, a, uh, was in some sort of deal with the, uh, with the community that you know, we'll provide the building and turn the lights on and provide staff but, but you've got to go out and get the collection. Uh, which is exactly how it was, and you know, happily, a man called Felton came along. But, but um, you know, that was um, that was clearly the nature of the way that these thing, things operated. So, so from that point of view, I think um, the fact that we're talking here now about uh, private sector support is simply 
an extension of something that's been going on for a long time that might have a particular bit of emphasis right now, but then the capacity to, to engage in private sector support is probably greater than it's been for, uh, for, for a decent period of time. And, and perhaps the two the, don't go together anyway. I mean, is there that question, you know, well, Rebecca perhaps could, could... Well, uh, the, the idea that, um, that safe work comes with private support and that, r that government money enables risk. So uh, if you look at something like... I don't think it's like quite as simple as that. No. I mean, I, uh, what about Mona, for example? That is an entirely mm. true. privately private funded... Privately funded and remains privately funded. Could, 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 could government money allow something like that to happen? Or has that happened only because it's come from private sector I, I think we have seen huge innovation with government money. I don't think it's yeah, quite as straightforward as one or the other. I think what's interesting, and I don't want to bring it back to the budget unless they, you know, but, you know, the pie is not going to get any bigger unless they introduce or, you know, change GST structures. We're not going to get any, you know, it, it's not going to change. So we're going to have to look at more creative ways of funding what it is we do. And I really do think that, you know, when you've got people that... Um, are not going to get a job start for six months in this current budget. We, it's very hard for us to make the case, mm. however much we support arts and culture, to say, well, actually, we should have got more. So therefore, budgets for exhibitions, budgets for programs continue to grow, you know, and, and, and we, you know, doing an exhibition now is much more expensive than in the 90s or in the 80s. We need to think about how it is we're going to fund that without compromising what we do. And I believe that whether you take government money or whether you take private money, there should be risk, there should be innovation, there should be excitements, and you need to grow and bring your audiences with you. So that's part of that. Totally this agree. is what we do, this yeah. is what we should do really well. I, and I, 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 would, I, love, I yeah. would argue that whether you take private money or public money, and arguably it should be both, because that's a bigger audience and it's more people talking about it, you know, this is what we have a responsibility to do working in the arts. And it's a both-end world, I, I think, not an either-or world. But I, I, I would love to see, <laughs> idealistically, perhaps one day, people rioting in the streets because the arts budget has been cut. And it's profoundly interesting to me that that doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's why I come back again, you know, maybe we've got to look at ourselves in, in the arts world and say, what are we doing? How do we get this further up the agenda as a matter of urgency? And I remember my first meeting as incoming chair of the Arts Council in New Zealand with the new Prime Minister, Helen Clark, and, and uh, her first question was, you know, what is the optimum amount of money that government should invest in the arts? And I said, I think that's the wrong question, Prime Minister. And she said, what's the right question? And I said, well, what kind of country do you want? Mm. And, um, and we were very fortunate about, about six months later, we got a massive investment of, of money into the arts by the government, which was terrific. But, um, and it was about that the, the kind of country New Zealand needed to be. Innovative, vibrant, questioning, and, and also socially harmonious. So um, I, I'd like to see the debate really, really raised around the value and essential nature of the arts in a modern democracy. But I think, I think it can be done. I remember um, 10 or so years ago, I was the head of development at the Sydney Symphony. And I can remember at the time, the government of the time was looking to make some cuts to orchestras around the country, and I remember there was a very well orchestrated campaign that happened um, where, where you know, MPs were lobbied around the country, and I can remember cabinet and it being televised, so, and, and those cuts I don't think happened, actually. Mm. I mean, there might be someone in the audience could, that could remember the detail, but I, I do remember that was a very mm. well orchestrated campaign that obviously was led by the, so it is possible yeah. to actually you know, advocate very strongly for the importance of the arts because, you know, let's face it, you know, symphony orchestras can be also fairly high-end arts. Mm. So, you mm. know, it, it, but it did work in that instance. But that does tie into what you were saying earlier. We, you know, we, were, we lived in the UK for many years and the level of advocacy and discussion about arts and culture in the newspapers at a very sophisticated level every day um, mm. was something that we don't see in yeah. the same way here. But but, but, but interestingly, it didn't stop substantial cuts occurring no, to, to the Arts right. Council. Yeah, and, and that's true. I, I mean, I think part of the thing is that, um, and we're talking a lot about this at the Australia Council now, of a, of a, of a vision of Australia as a culturally ambitious nation. Mm. Um, and we don't talk enough about the ambition that we have within the, within the cultural sector. Um, and the idea of sort of selling a vision of that more broadly uh, across the, the community even, and to have uh, 
um, you know, that sort of advocacy at a community level. I mean, we, we know, and I, I, you know, we, it gets very tedious talking about sport, but we, we know that twice as many people uh, attend cultural events mm. than sporting events. We know that more people go to galleries than to AFL games. We, we know that. Uh, and yet, you know, it's very hard to, to then um, completely understand why we get 10 minutes of sport uh, and, and zero of arts on, uh, on, on news bulletins. Now, you know, part of that is that, frankly, we're not demanding enough. Uh, we're not demanding that we have that coverage. We're not demanding that we, have, we give that visibility. But in a culturally ambitious nation, if that's what you believe, if, if that's the conviction that you have, and I think it is the conviction mm -hmm. that, we, that, uh, that, we, that, that a number of us in the sector do have, but it's something that can be shared more broadly, then I think you know, that's something that changes attitudes and, and, and changes the demeanour around which uh, this whole discussion takes place. Louise, in, in such a, a tight um, economic environment that we're facing at the moment, do you think the government has the responsibility, or do you think the government should be funding things that the private sector can support? Kind of where's that line? Where, where should government funding end and private support kick in? Well, look, it, it, it's very grey, you know, these days. I mean, because, you know, I think a lot of people say to me, well, government will tend to fund the safe things and philanthropy will take the bigger risks. And I think there's no question that philanthropy will take the bigger risks um, but I you know I don't I hope we don't get to the point where government feels that philanthropy will just fill every gap um, that is going to appear be because of cuts because that would be a big worry I mean philanthropists have a lot of freedom um, but it's not a bottomless pit and you know th there's no there's no one stereotype for what a philanthropist will fund I mean the encouraging thing is that we are starting to see more philanthropists and more foundations fund in the operating space. I mean, it's interesting mm. how many philanthropists these days will fund the creation of a development role. And you probably wouldn't have seen that in Australia 10 or 15 years ago. But I, I, I mean, what I am looking for is, I, I know what we saw in the UK, and it's a bit early to tell mm. the results because they had such significant cuts in, I think it was 2010. But the, fu the funding cuts were you know, 20 to 25 per cent across the board. They were very significant. Mm. But the government of the day uh, responded with an $80 million stimulus package to encourage more philanthropy, 80 million, not, not eight. Mm. So, um, and the bulk of that was for match funding. Now, there are some pros and cons about match funding because, of course, it can be fairly short term. But, you know, I'd love to see the government... Um, look in that stimulus area. The problem is, of course, it's right across the board, so it's not just arts, but um, that's what I'd be looking for. And Big Z, um, the biggest funders of the arts are, of course, artists themselves who have a mean salary of, I think it's $18,000 or somewhere around there, so th through unpaid wages. Whose responsibility is it to give, do you think? Is everyone responsible or is it just the wealthy? I, I think... Um there's that great speech that John F. Kennedy gave about a month before he, he was killed at, at Amherst, in, in Amherst University in October 1963. Robert Frost, the poet, had died earlier that year. And it is, if, if, you, if you want to Google it and read it, it, it is the best description of why a country and a government in a Western democracy or any country should fund artists and the arts, because it simply makes it a better country. And in, in my view, I think it is definitely the responsibility of, of a civilised nation to fund creators of, of questioning, provocative work and also creators of extraordinary beauty. And so Kennedy captures this thing that, that a, a democracy needs people like artists, creative people, who will challenge it and test it, but also people who will, who will lift our sights beyond the everyday. And, and the other great thing he talks about, and, and Rupert would know this very well, you know, in terms of, of, of the, the tradition of the, of the Arts Council in the UK, the progenitor really of all the, the, the Arts Councils in the English-speaking world, is this arm's length principle. And Kennedy puts it very well, you know, that the, um, the artist, the composer, the writer must be true to themselves and let the chips fall where they may. And, 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 that, and I think our, our, our system as it stands is pretty good in terms of the role of government. And, and again, I'd just like to see the debate happen on another level 
around not just funding the arts, but some, maybe you even have to change the brand name of the arts, but so, mm. call it something around mm. essential, you know, spiritual or cultural infrastructure. Yet man is talking branding. And, and, <laughs> for a, and for a particularly cheap fee, we could do that. <laughs> I was looking at Rupert. <laughs> yeah, that's right. there Rupert there can make that. Would thing, you like though. my card, Rupert? No, no, just <laughs> that's right. Rebecca. From when Kennedy spoke to now, and I don't know why I'm being the person that says this, being I should be the champion of the arts and completely agree, but from when Kennedy spoke to now, things have changed enormously. Mm. We have seen um, the proliferation of master's degrees in you know, the visual arts, uh, the professionalisation of industries, of, of the arts industry. So you know, I, like many other people, are professional curators. Um, and so that has changed. We have many more artists, many more creative practitioners who don't just call themselves artists, 10 or 15 years out of art school uh, from an undergraduate degree, call themselves artists and are wanting to get gigs and sell work and um, be part of this um, arts ecology when they're still at art school. So the number of, the, just the very sheer number of people has exponentially grown. And that's a really, really interesting point, Rebecca, because one of the things I learnt and which I had many debates with government about in, in New Zealand was there, there is no finite arts budget. If you, if you invest in the arts, you, you'll create more art mm. and you, you'll create all sorts of things that need more investment. So that, that's a really hard model. It's I, like the I, I storage racks in a museum. Yeah. You know, you design a new museum, it's state of the arts, it's fabulous, it's really exciting, and before you've even mm -hmm. moved in, mm. you haven't got enough storage space. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Rupert, I, I want to um, ask a question around um, corporate sponsorship. Um, of course, George Brandis um, has famously said that we, uh, we, as artists, shouldn't unreasonably refuse corporate money that is um, offered to us. Now, those of us in the biz know that corporate money very rarely is sort of offered to us, but <laughs> we put that aside for a moment. Um, do, do you think he's right? Are there, are there ethical considerations that we need to consider when, when receiving corporate money? And, and if we are to, um, to not accept corporate money, are we no longer deserving of government money? Uh, I wasn't entirely not expecting <laughs> that, that question, <laughs> Simon. Look, I think I begin the response by saying that um, uh, private sector support for the arts it, is a complex ecosystem itself. And um, uh, Louise uh, has talked a lot about philanthropy and um, there's been reference to, to benefaction and there's been reference to corporate support and there's been, um, you know, th there, are, there are a whole lot of different dimensions of, uh, uh, of this and exactly what, what it means. And, um, you know, philanthropy is a different, um, is a different sort of entity, um, uh, particularly philanthropy that isn't your own philanthropy. So for example, in the case of Felton, the Felton trustees today are administering someone else's philanthropic act. Um, it's not their own philanthropic act, and even within families, um, um, you know, one's often uh, administering the philanthropic act of a grandfather, uh, and you have no say in whether or not you're going to do it. It's there to be done. There's a job to be done. That is, that, uh, that grants need to be made, and that's a, a very different issue around you know, branding and what it is and what the adjacencies are and uh, all those other considerations. In the corporate space, I think it is a different um, uh, issue, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I think that um, um, arts organisations generally need to be very savvy about who they want to create adjacencies with. You know, they, they, need to make, they need to make the choice. Um, uh, in the UK, in a number of galleries, there are particular um, uh, organisations where, you know, grants of more than £20,000, um, you know, an entire due diligence process needs to be undertaken on, uh, on, on the organisation. Um, you know, having, uh, having said that, uh, and, and coming back specifically to your, uh, to your question, I mean, we were asked by, the Australia Council was asked by the Minister to, uh, uh, to look at uh, the policy issues around, um, you know, what it looks like when government is funding uh, an organisation, if that organisation appears to have declined private sector support. And it's, um, firstly, it's not unusual to be asked to, to prepare a bit of policy for the government, and we haven't yet concluded that exercise because we want to look at what some of the examples are in other parts of the world. But I can tell you, there aren't too many examples around the world where, mm -hmm. um, uh, where a government would uh, choose to withdraw its funding because uh, uh, an organisation hadn't, uh, 
uh, hadn't accepted private sector support. And frankly, I didn't know how you'd ever know. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I totally you know, agree. If, if someone comes in and said, look, I'd, I'd, I'd love to give you a million dollars, but uh, but I want my name plastered all over the mm. uh, the wall, and you say, well, we won't do that. Is that, a, is that declining, or is it a, a, con a conditional non-acceptance or an unconditional something? So it, it, it's a complex matter. Um, and, um, uh, but there are very few examples that would suggest that policy is heading in that direction. And I mean, it did, of course, um, it was sparked, of course, by the, the Transfield um, saga, shall we say. Um, I mean, Bigsy, you, you are a resident expert in um, brand transference. Um, you know, do, do you think that the, um, are the arts too, are we too poor to have a moral conscience? No, no, I, I mean, <laughs> a principle is not a principle until it costs you money. Um, somebody wise once said. I, I'm black and white on this. I mean, governments um, are under, I, I, I guess, the principles of, of, of arts councils and, and the arm's length principle um, should, should invest money in the arts and stay out of it. And, and to use threats or, you know, or we're going we're gonna to reduce funding or whatever, I've been through that. And it's, it's not right and it shouldn't happen. And, and again, it comes back to that that, that age-old bedrock platform is, is you must allow artistic freedom. However, I also know that um, if you look at the history of the Arts Council in the UK, uh, uh, was it Lord Kane started mm, it? And, and it went through various manifestations. Governments put in money, governments took away money. It's going to be with governments because it's a political relationship as, as, as well as a transactional relationship. It's going to be rocky. And my degrees in Latin and English literature, which prepared me brilliantly for advertising, um, it, this started way back. I mean, Ovid was sent into exile by the Emperor Augustus for, for writing the wrong stuff, writing, you know, smutty love poetry. And he was, he was exiled for it. And that will, that will remain with us. But good governments stay out of it. And Louise, how, how do you think um, organisations should make those decisions? Should, should they have a, an ethical receiving policy? How, how do organisations decide what corporate money to receive and not to receive? Well, there's no question they should. Um, they should absolutely have um, some sort of guidelines in this space for donations, foundation grants and corporate sponsorship. Um, we have it, when I was at the Sydney Symphony, we had it. It, it certainly made organisations now sharpen that pen Mm -hmm. because uh, there's no question, you know, it, it, even just recently we had, it, we had an instance in the last month where we had a good hard look at something and asked that question, where does that money come from? And it did, it, we, we actually did decline to p progress it. You know, we're actually a non-profit ourselves. You know, we're not, we're not government funded. Um, but I, you know, it, it was a very unfortunate um, situation, I have to say, what happened with the Biennale of Sydney and Transfield. I mean, very unfortunate. I mean, let's face it, it's hard enough getting corporate support in Australia, yep. let alone globally, let alone without that. Um, but, but Louisa, if, to me, <laughs> there's some things that governments do that aren't right either. Hmm. So like spying on your allies, like Indonesia. So, so will organisation, arts organisations still take government money? Yeah, I think they would. So I, I, I think if you're going to be pure about it, you'd better be consistently pure if you're hmm. an arts organisation. Does the arms length process protect organisations in that? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying that, that if you're going to accept, if, if you regard private sector money as tainted, I mean, let, 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 I'm not saying this should happen, but I'm saying just in terms of consistent behaviour, then often, you know, governments do things that aren't morally conscionable either. And, yep. and so do individuals. I yeah. mean, is, no, there, is there a difference between receiving um, Luca Bongiorno Nettis's private money as chairman of Transfield between, or receiving the money from Transfield themselves? Louise? What do you think, Louise? Well, I mean, there is. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a actually it's not a publicly listed company. I don't think Transfield. I think it's it's private actually. But you know, there is lots of issues. I think around shareholder money. But but I think you know it it, it all can be. You know, you can trace lots mm. of issues around where the money comes from. If you if you really chose to look at, you can look at companies and and look at how they're investing. Um, mm. And, you know, that could cause some non-profits and arts organisations to say, well, do we actually really want to, to get in? But, you know, I mean, that's... It, it, it can just... It can also get quite be, ridiculous as should well. Should we be doing that? Well, it, we're not. I mean, I don't believe we're... Go, we're not, well, I'm a non-profit and I'm raising money for the private sector. We don't go that far. 
No. So you would accept money from him, from the chairman of Transfield, for example? Oh, absolutely. Yep. From, They're a would, member of ours. And, and would you, great. And would you accept money from Transfield? Your Transfield Foundation is also a member of ours. And the Biennale of Sydney is also a member of ours. <laughs> and did you have any uh, fallout from your members or response to the Transfield incident? No, not at all. I mean, I, I think from a philanthropy point of view, which is obviously primarily what we're focused yeah. on, I, I don't see um, that issue having a negative impact upon uh, private giving and philanthropy. What I do worry about a bit is is the impact on on the corporate side of things, particularly in the edgier sort of arts, because I think organisations like your Sydney Symphony, your National Gallery of Victoria, etc., are very safe options for the corporate sector. But you know, let's face it, where a lot of it's needed is in the small to medium sector, and um, and also for individual artists. But then again, it may challenge those organisations to be finding brands that are that are more riskier as well and probably more willing to take those risks with organisations in that in that small to medium space. We're going to go to audience questions in, in just one minute. Um, Rebecca, where's the line? Is there a line for you in terms of corporate sponsorship? I mean, is, is there such a thing as, as clean money? Mm-hmm. Possibly not, but where is the degree? And I think that's the question. There are degrees and degrees. So if you look historically, even in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, I, again, I worked in the, UK's in, the 1990, in the UK in the 1990s, and we regularly um, received um, support from Absolute Vodka, Bex, uh, and a huge number of mm. um, uh, companies, organisations, who, whose business it was to make alcohol. Um, now, you know, I think that comes back to that point that you need to have some sort of discussion before something like this blows up uh, so that if it should, you've got some recourse or you know where to go. Um, similarly, if you look back to the late 1960s, you know, Philip Morris was a huge sponsor mm. of the arts. They saw the arts as avant-garde, as edgy, as exciting. Now, you know, we probably wouldn't accept money from a cigarette manufacturer. Um, if an arms dealer comes to you, you're probably going to say thank you very much, but no. But again, you're doing this within a framework uh, through which you can discuss it. And I think it's an incredibly complex issue, you know, what, what's happened in Sydney. And for the Biennale, you know, 600,000 is a lot of money in this climate. Um, more as disturbing as the money, as the cash, is the fallout mm. from this. And the fact that visual artists have the risk of marginalising themselves. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have done it, but what we should be careful of is when a personal belief in issue then goes into the sort of secondary realm and is taken up and picked up by other things. So again, it comes back to as an institution, I think you don't want to let, you don't, you want to try and ensure that this sort of thing shouldn't and doesn't happen. So have some sort of discussion, have some sort of policy. The policy is going to be porous, you know, mm. because you're going to have to look at these things on a case-by-case basis. Um, what we in Melbourne, what the artists in Melbourne perhaps weren't as familiar with, you know, was very well known in Sydney, you know. Artists in Sydney knew what Transfield did. Artists in Sydney knew that it was part of a portfolio, um, you know. <laughs> So, so it may, it, you need to be able to discuss it so that those people that you're then going to work with have the information. And, so and I don't know that I can say, is it, you know, is it clean or is it not clean? I just think that you need to be really clear about <laughs> what your policies, what your strategies are, and also dissemination of information so that people can then make their own mind up. And one, just one thing before you ask your next question is, you know, Sorry, I'm, I'm holding... Big Z, I'm sorry. No, I'm no, you don't. <laughs> um, but, you know, why, why is it particular to the visual arts? Why is it that this happened now? I think it's part of a groundswell where local politics are playing out on this international platform as part of a globalised world. You can look at Istanbul mm. Biennale, uh, you can look at the Sydney Biennial, um, San Paolo, which is coming up at the end of the year, has, as its agenda, uh, looked mm. at art and social change. Um, so that's part of a bigger thing, and that has to do with the Biennale as a platform for these things to potentially play out. Um, 
the other thing is that visual artists really relatively get a very little amount of money for participating in something like the Biennale. It's hugely prestigious, it's very important, but if they get an artist fee of $1,000 or $2,000 and they've usually put all that towards making the work of art, you know, they're doing quite well. Um, so they can vote with their feet in a way that the musicians can't because they're part of an orchestra that's right. and that's their bread and butter. As a collective group, they're much less likely to go out yep. on, a, on a, a, a matter of principle. So I think that's the big difference. Um, and, I, and it's perhaps not something that actually came out in the debate. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, certainly, um, you know, it's regardless of kind of what you think of the, the decision or their action, I mean, it is in a number of ways an extraordinary thing that this kind of dis disparate group of poor artists were able to come together and, and create an, o an artwork, really, which was that open letter um, that had a, a pretty extraordinary response. Well, yes, I agree. Um, but I also think that if you ask for something in a letter, you should be prepared for the consequences. And it's not enough to say we had no idea that, that, tran that the Biennale would roll over. Uh, if you ask for something, you need to think about what are the implications of my action. So it's no different from an ethics, you know, something around ethics. You need to have, you need to have thought about this. Speaking of asking for things, it is time for our audience questions. How's that for a segue? <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any questions for our illustrious panel? I can see hands up already. Is it on? Yeah. Um, my question is one uh, where we've seen over the last few years a number of sovereign funds set up within Australia for various uh, things and I wondered whether the arts uh, funding, uh, arts companies and arts uh, organisations should be lobbying government to set one up for the arts. Mm. Louise? Yeah, I mean, I suppose we've had the Future Fund, we've just had the announced in the government the medical research fund. I mean, um, it, 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 it would be worth a look. I mean, I suppose Rupert mm. might have a view on this. I don't know whether the Australia Council is, or Creative Partnerships Australia mm. is looking at this issue, but um, I, I gather with the, the medical research fund that, I mean, that is years of work um, that went into that being announced. Uh, so it was a very well orchestrated um, plan and campaign that was, it was 60 million, I think, wasn't it? Was it 60 million that was announced? So, you know, that, that is very significant for the future of medical research. So, you know, I, personally, I'd love to see something like that in the arts, but I don't, Rupert might have a... There, there have been some variations of it. So at various times when the framework for the major performing arts um, um, uh, companies was established after the Nugent Inquiry, um, there was an incentive for each of those companies to build up endowments and they were matched by, by the Commonwealth Government, so uh, the savings within those companies uh, had that. Um, I mean, there is, a, I think, a, a really interesting New Zealand example where a lot of the uh, uh, Indigenous communities were supported uh, with the creation of endowments that becomes uh, um, I you know, their uh, principal source of, uh, of wealth and funding for a whole lot of different uh, Indigenous a activities, and that, that's, uh, that's quite an, an interesting model to, to look at. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, government has a whole lot of roles and, um, um, you know, Louise mentioned the private ancillary funds before. Um, you know, enabling legislation to, um, to create things is one of those roles and so from 2001 to now, I think about, what, 12 or 1300 private foundations have been created in, in Australia. And you say, well, what's the government contribution? That Well, the government contribution, the Commonwealth government contribution is the, the revenue foregone. Um, in the deductibility mm. that's, uh, that's been applied to the creation of what's probably billions, billions of dollars worth Great. of corpus now. Um, mm. So, you know, there are all these sort of things that are a little bit invisible uh, around what, uh, what government does in this space. Now, of course, that's not all for the, for the arts, as we were saying, but, but a decent element of, um, uh, a, 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 you know, a decent part of the distributions from PAFs actually have come into arts organisations. Um, but it, it, it's, that's not an idea that's going to go away either, the, the, the one that you've raised. I, I think it, uh, 
it, it is an interesting one to consider. When I was at the National Gallery of Australia, we were talking about issuing cultural bonds as a way of uh, mm. trying to fund the purchases of works of art, uh, uh, bringing those not entirely into the gallery's collection, um, but holding them in a way that uh, there could be something around the return on the bonds mm. and tax deductibility for investing. And uh, But then if anyone wanted their money back, then you might have to sell the object. And uh, what if it had gone down in value? And maybe the government should just give the money for the purchases anyway. But um, nevertheless, um, mm. th there's some quite interesting thinking going on in this space right now. Thank you. We had another question down the front. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question um, sort of that's leading on from what Rupert was saying about the... the is it PAFs? Is that what we're calling them? Hmm. Um, and the small to medium slash individual artists. I've um, benefited from a, this, a project where I raised some funds through the creative partnerships and also through the Documentary Australia Foundation, which provides DGR status to individuals or small companies to raise money. And that was that's great incentive, but what I've come up against as a problem is when I'm approaching... Um, individuals or families or, or, or companies is that I'm often referred to their foundations, which are great because they can give, they can give money. Um, but because I'm not a charity, I'm not a TCC charity, a lot of time people have said, this is a great project. We, we like you. We, DGR is fantastic. So I guess it's kind of an accounting question. But TCC um, eludes me and it eludes anyone who isn't doesn't have the infrastructure and the size to have be a charity as well. And I, I guess, I don't know, mm. if Louise, if you want to could speak to that a bit. Yeah, it's taking me back to my art support days. <laughs> I used to see people like you all the time. Um, look, that is, that is an issue, there's no question, because, you know, to, to access foundation grants, typically you need the, the charitable status and you also need the tax deductible status. And not for all of them, but... Um, so it is an issue and I suppose I'm not sure that's actually going to be changed in Australia in the foreseeable future. So I think one really has to concentrate much more in your situation on, on, on private donors. And, you know, I, I know that does cut out foundation grants, but you also need to remember it's a very similar to the States where I think it's only about 10 or 12 per cent of giving that actually comes from foundations. So, you know, it, it is a relatively small piece of the pie compared to, you know, private giving from individuals, whether it's someone giving $200 or $200 million or anything in between. That's really where the focus, you know, should be. I mean, where I'm about to run some workshops around the country on understanding these private ancillary funds for the non-profit sector. In fact, I'm doing it in Melbourne on the 2nd of June. And, you know, I think sometimes... Um, recipients, non-profits, including arts organisations, can be a bit too fixated about private ancillary funds as well. I mean, just remember there is a whole swag of potential donors out there um, who really have the capacity to give regularly as well and they don't necessarily have a structure. And is there um, sort of policy or regulatory change that you'd like to see? Well, there's no question we would like to see it easier for more organisations to achieve tax deductible status because one of the issues in Australia is it's not that easy to get. Interesting enough, it's actually a little bit easier to get in the arts yeah. than it is in other parts of the non-profit sector. And some of you may know that if you're involved in, in, in non-profits outside of the arts. So a lot of people, you know, now I've got a bigger hat on and I'm across the non-profit sector, I do have a lot of people talk to me about how it actually seems to be a lot easier in the arts than it is outside the arts. But the, the charitable status issue, um, you know, is actually relatively easy to get if you're an incorporated non-profit. That's not really the issue. The issue is if you're an individual, that's tough to get. And, and we used to have individual artists sometimes approach us who were thinking about incorporating and becoming a non-profit. And sometimes we'd counsel against that saying, look, don't just do it because you think it's going to be easy to attract philanthropic funding because there's a whole lot of other paperwork and governance and all sorts of things you've got to um, put up with if you convert into a non-profit. So it's tricky. I, I, you know, it's, there's, not a, there's not a simple solution on that front, but I think it's about you know, uh, talking to Creative Partnerships Australia and getting more tips on how you can do the private giving better because I still think that is very untapped in Australia. And Bigsy, 
is there how, how do you think we can encourage more people to give well i was just <laughs> Uh, sitting here thinking um, that the whole corporate world's got incredibly boring. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I... Was it not to start with? And, and, I, and I'm just trying to... I'm a Gemini. Come with me on this, this strange journey. But I, 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 when I began working um, many years ago, I'm 56, although looking at my gym-toned body, you might be surprised to know that. <laughs> um, uh, I began at Shell. And it was a, in New Zealand, and it was a Shell in New Zealand was a large company and a tremendous supporter of the arts because the, the managing director and the managing director's wife loved the arts, and the, there, was, there was no strategic reason that they were involved in the arts. There were no KPIs, there were no strategy papers. They just loved the arts. Good friend of mine, John Allen, ran New Zealand Post, loved literature and books. So New Zealand Post supported writers, supported literary awards, supported oh, so many things in the literary space. But now it just seems to me, and, and it's no surprise that sort of corporate giving is, is, is plateauing out or on the decline and private philanthropy is, is rising somewhat because individuals are giving money for things they love. And, and I kind of wish maybe one of the ways that we could get more money for the arts would be just to encourage um, entrepreneurial individuals, whatever we can do to assist them to, to have prosperous entities and organisations and companies, so they can give things to things that they love, like the arts. And that's a weird journey. But I, 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 I do lament that the lack of eccentricity, passion, and just pure love of, of things that CEOs support. And I think we've been over-corporatised. And in your mm. um, corporate work, when you yes. are advising organisations on their branding and, and advertising, yeah. do you uh, come up very often with... Uh, Corporates who, who talk to you about giving to the arts or sponsoring the arts or supporting the arts as uh, well, something well, they want to do? I, I was involved the other day with talking to somebody, I won't say which arts organisation, but I think the arts organisations themselves can be hopefully more innovative in tailoring things so that a corporate can use that property. for And, and there's a win-win situation for both the, the sponsor and the sponsored arts organisation. And that now takes a lot of innovation and a lot of um, ability and intelligence and intuition to construct that kind of thing. But I think that's where a lot more work could be done. And Rebecca, for you, are there ways that, that you see that we could move forward to encourage more people to, be, to support the arts? I think it's about growing audiences. And I, I, it's not that there's this vast untapped audience. I think that it's a story that you have to develop, that you have to tell, um, you have to bring people with you, you have to enable them to bring their own stories and feel a part of it. And so once you've got that going, I think, um, you know, you then have to ask. And there's nothing the matter with asking. And usually when you do ask, you know, people will come to the party. Um, so there's that aspect. Um, I, I was just, can I build on that, Rebecca? Sorry, Michael Billington, The Guardian, theatre critic. I, I remember I, I met him and I said, what, what? You know, what will ensure the future of the arts? And he said, just to your point, cheap seats. Um, you know, <coughs> a, a, actually allowing people to come and enjoy the arts for whatever reason and having them accessible. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, we now know that, you know, um, a huge number of people go to galleries to meet people, you know, for a date. Um, not necessarily to look at the art, but as a great social place. So Is that what I've been doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I think the other thing I wanted to pick up on from you, I'm moving on from that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even going there. Uh, but the, this aspect of, you know, how can we work better with corporates? Um, yes, I think that we can both work out what each other wants and we can make sure that it's a win-win situation. But often these arts organisations run on the smell of an oily rag. And you've got a curator who might actually have to sweep the leaves off the front of the, you know, of the gallery before they go in and start talking to artists and doing the show. So you are this sort of polymath. And increasingly, as corporates get sophisticated about what they want, we have to service that. And I use the word quite consciously. Um, I'm all in favour of being ambitious and I'm happy to work with development teams to say, look, I can go and I'm happy to work with you, be passionate, talk about the idea for the show, talk about the vision for the institution, and you need a bit of raw, you know, guts to get you over the line sometimes. That's great, and you're walking together. But when development departments become bigger, 
than the curators that mm. put on the shows, then I think you have to say, so what's our core business here? Mm. I, I, can I just make one comment? I think one thing that the arts has to be aware of is that you know we, we actually run a um, very successful, it's quite new, but it's a young donor program for people in their their 20s and 30s, and it's about training up future leaders. Do and they offer dating a, as well? Well, actually, <laughs> Can they we go do. Back to the dating yeah, they're actually, they're actually <laughs> asked, I know. There actually are some KPIs that I joke with my manager of that program about. I'm sure there'll be some marriages and some uh, partnerships that'll result from that program. But the interesting thing is that they either have inherited wealth or self-made wealth. And the number one cause area by far in that group, and there's now just about 200, in fact, Rupert has a son who's in mm. the program, is international giving, is, is, is overseas giving. So what's interesting is that that group have travelled a lot, they've come from privileged backgrounds, they've, they've been to developing countries, they often believe their money can go further. So that's the number one cause area that they're interested in supporting. And then, of course, Indigenous and environment are sort of second mm. and third, and arts is about fourth. So what's interesting is they're doing, you know, their giving patterns are very different to what their parents or grandparents might have been. And that's, I think, one of the challenges mm. for uh, the arts is that. Our final question is going to come from the floor. Hello. I'm just wondering if each of you could say why you think art is important. Oh. Was, that, was that for Rupert? Was that question? Oh, sorry, for, for everyone. Um, oh, for everyone. I mean, Peter mentioned it uh, quite a lot earlier, but I'd just like to hear from everyone else. That's a nice way to end. Hmm. I, don't, I, I just can't imagine... Hmm my life without it. I mean, I, I happen to be very passionate about sport and sports. Um, I worked on the Olympics, um, but I just can't imagine my day without it. I mean, I, it's anything from watching new drama on the ABC through to um, graffiti on the side of a street. I mean, I, 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 can't, I, I just think my life would be so much poorer. I can't imagine life without it. And, and I think that's, that's the worry, is that so many people are not exposed to the joy um, of, of art and, and also, for that matter, giving. Rupert, do you want to respond to that as well? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a really good question. Mm. And, and mm. look, there are some great pithy answers. I mean, I, I, I think it's what you live for. Um, mm. uh, and uh, I walked into a house the other day um, and there was no artwork on, on the wall and it just felt such an empty, mm. lonely place. Um, and um, even, you know, draw it yourself and put it on. But it, just live with crea creativity and expression. I, um, it's a bit like a house that doesn't have any books for me. You know, mm. books are full of ideas. They take you into other worlds. And I think that great art needs to feed the heart, the mind and the soul. Mm. And I don't think it always has to be beautiful. And I don't think that we always have to respond aesthetically. And perhaps some of the most moving experiences that I've had, or moving mightn't even be the right word, the things that have lodged in my mind not, mightn't necessarily be things that I've loved. I've worried about them, I've puzzled about them, I come back to them, I visually walk around them, I punch them, you know. They stay with me and I'll carry that memory for years. And suddenly it can be 10 or 20 years down the track, I'll go, oh, I think I... Not sure I've got it, but I've actually got a different perspective on what pe maybe that art of artist intuitively was trying to do. So it needs to be all of that. I know that uh, our audience tonight will keep with them for years what they have uh, what we have talked about tonight. Um, I want to thank Fip Murray, who uh, has been working with me to curate this panel tonight. And uh, if you would join with me to thank our extraordinary panel, Rupert Meyer, Rebecca Coates, Peter Biggs, Louise Walsh. <laughs> Coming up soon. Coming up soon.